Thank you very much, uh, Yuri, for that introduction. Uh, it's lovely to be here. This is one of my favorite conferences uh, to come to, um, and it's a real privilege uh, and a pleasure uh, to be able to moderate this conversation uh, with High Representative Federica Mogherini. Um, I don't think I need to say anything more to introduce you. Everybody knows you, and we have um, limited time, so perhaps we can just get straight into it. Um, your predecessor, Catherine Ashton, um, had this incredibly difficult job of um, creating the European External Action Service uh, from scratch um, while dealing with um, on, ongoing crises. And on several occasions, she described this as like trying to fly a plane while still building the wings. Um, uh, and um, this was all also happening at the time of the Euro crisis with all of the implications of that in terms of the limited bandwidth that politicians had um, and the new fault lines that emerged within the EU. Um, and then there were foreign policy crises as well, the Arab Spring, and then obviously the Ukraine crisis um, at, the end of, at the end of 2013. You took over at the end of 2014, um, and hopefully um, the, the wings now have been built and work. Um, some of the crises which had started under Ashton, like the Ukraine crisis, Syria, were still ongoing. Um, but it seems to me that you also now face a whole series of new challenges. I don't know if we can call them crises, but uh, I'm thinking particularly of Brexit and Trump, the election of Trump as, as US president, which in some ways it seems to me are even more difficult um, for the EU to deal with because they're about the parameters of, of EU foreign policy. So in, in a way, the, the sort of overall question that I'd, that I'd love to, to ask you really is whether after the events of 2016, um, uh, in particular Brexit and the election of Trump, uh, whether the EU really needs to go back to the drawing board uh, to kind of start from scratch in terms of thinking about what European foreign policy should be precisely at a time when you'd already come up with a global strategy um, that, that attempted to, to do this. Um, but maybe we can take them, them one by one and, and, and start with, with, with Brexit. Um, and I, I suppose the question really is, how is it possible to have a European foreign policy without Britain? Um, there seem to be two ways of looking at this. One is that the British decision to leave the EU is a tremendous blow for the EU, for EU foreign policy because of the loss of resources, particularly military resources. The other view seems to be that actually it's, a, it's an opportunity because it means that the rest of the EU at 27 can move ahead with um, integration, uh, particularly in foreign policy, security and defence policy, uh, in areas where um, Britain had, had blocked uh, integration uh, in the past. Um, what's your view on that? Um, is, it, uh, is it a blow or, or, or an opportunity for, for EU foreign policy? Well, uh, I'll answer the question, I promise. But first of all, I would like to say how delighted I am to be back. Uh, to be back after 2013, I was already honoured to address this uh, conference. As a member, uh, simple member of the Italian Parliament, uh, I'm also very glad to see that at the time, my Italian Prime Minister is also joining the conference here, so you have an Italian wave of migration to Tallinn uh, that is not due to the weather, I can assure you, uh, but maybe of the light. And I was thinking, uh, hearing from your introductory remarks, uh, the question whether there's light uh, or, or dark, uh, maybe in this part of Europe, depends on the season. Uh, but what you can be sure of is that at a certain moment, either of the day or of the year, you will get some light. And I think we're getting there uh, also in terms of European perspective. Second, before I answer the question, and I promise I do, I, uh, let me say that I'm really honoured uh, to be uh, opening this, uh, this conference, uh, the presence of the President, of the Prime Minister, of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, of so many friends, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Latvia, uh, of Rose, uh, witnessing the strong EU-NATO partnership. I'm really honoured uh, to have such a, a great audience uh, and uh, uh, having had an excellent bilateral visit uh, here to uh, Estonia to prepare the upcoming uh, presidency. Having said that, um, is the EU foreign policy possible today? Uh, it's not only possible, it's much more needed today than it has ever been. I know my job has often been described as the impossible job uh, because of possible divisions among member states, uh, the diplomacy you need to exercise within the European Union more than outside of diverging interests. I can tell you in this two years and a half, I'm exactly half mandate now, I have seen that there is in the world of today no other way of having a foreign policy for each of our member states 
if not through the European Union strong foreign and security policy. I often say I believe there are two kinds of member states, those that are small and those that have not yet realized they are small. We are living in a world where you need to relate to uh, continent-sized powers. Not only the United States, but you take China or India, being it on security, being it on trade, being it on rule of law, whatever, you have to have the size, the weight, to uh, have an impact. And, uh, you know, the European Union is much more than sometimes the European citizens realize. We are the first market in the world, and we will continue to be, even after Brexit. We are the second largest economy in the world, and we will continue to be, even after Brexit. We are the first humanitarian donor in the world, even after Brexit. We are the first uh, provider of development assistance in the world, even after Brexit. Actually, we're doing more on development and humanitarian than the rest of the world combined. We are the first contributor to, to the UN system. We are the first trading partner for most of the countries in the world, and I could continue. This to say that sometimes we underestimate the power we have, and underestimating it or downplaying it, we hurt ourselves. So I think the main challenge Europeans have when it comes to uh, their role in the world is uh, a sort of uh, lack of self-confidence. You ask me if it is still possible to have a foreign policy without the UK? Sure. I think the UK will face many more problems than us after the Brexit. And the very same fact that it is taking them more than nine months to start negotiations after the results of the referendum tells you it's much more complicated than they calculate it. Uh, normally, the European Union is accused of being slow. Well, if after a referendum that they have a very clear result, it took them nine months just to ask to start negotiations, well, I'm saying maybe it's not us being slow and complex, it's democracy probably that is slow and complex. And you know, even in terms of military power you mentioned, I looked at the numbers. The UK is contributing to our military missions and operations with 5% of troops. You're asking me if without 5% we will continue to have our 15 military operations? Yes. But, but there's an important role that British military resources play even beyond CSDP missions, isn't there? And I suppose the, 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 the worry would be that you know, some of the things you described in terms of Europe's power um, are to do with soft power. And the fear might be, uh, and I'd be interested if you share it, that, um, that Britain's withdrawal from the EU increases this dependence that the EU has on soft power rather than, than hard power. You see, I'm living the paradox. Uh, if you're asking me the reason why this is happening now, um, it would be interesting to elaborate on that as well. But we're living the paradox that in the last eight, nine months, we have done more on European defense than in the previous 60 years. With a level of unity, unanimous decisions still at 28, Yes. On the military side, on the hard power side of the European Union, using the instruments we have in the treaties, the Treaty of Lisbon, we have never used. Why? Because after the Treaty of Lisbon, the economic and financial crisis was the top of the political agenda for all leaders in Europe, while today, security is number one priority, including for Estonian uh, public opinion and leaderships and presidency, which means that Europeans have finally realized, I believe, that we cannot afford anymore to have instruments and resources we could put together at the European Union level on defense and not to use them. And for the first time, we've developed with NATO a clear understanding of the fact that strengthening European defense is also a way of strengthening the EU member states that are also NATO allies and that can spend better, for instance, developing capabilities that then they can use also in NATO operations, or it's a better way of sharing responsibility. Normally we say burden sharing, I prefer to say responsibility sharing across the Atlantic. Strengthening the European pillar of defense is a way also of strengthening NATO. So finally, and this is a paradox, exactly after Brexit, or actually we're not there yet, I'm still sharing uh, three formations of the Council where we're 28. Absolutely. So we're not there yet, but still after the decision of the UK to leave the European Union, we have actually accelerated our work on the European defense in a way that is unprecedented in the European history. 
I don't believe this is because now the UK is out and we're free to run. I don't think it's because of this. I think it's because we understood that we have, we cannot anymore have the luxury of not using a potential we have. And this is why I believe that under the Estonian presidency, we will be able to have ambitious decisions on permanent structure cooperations, on the use of battle groups, on making operational contributions to the security of the world, which means also the security of European citizens. And what about some of the other ways in which European foreign policy might change without Britain? One of the things I heard, um, actually particularly from people in this part of Europe um, during the referendum campaign uh, in Britain, um, was that they worried that um, without Britain, um, uh, European policy towards Russia in particular would become less balanced, that it would essentially become a more pro-Russian policy without one of the big, more hawkish member states. Is that a fear that you share? No, uh, you know, we always take decisions by unanimity. Uh, and we have a common ground, which is not the minimum denominator, it's the common interests. And this is never determined by one member state agenda over the others. It's always the search for what kind of interest we share what kind of interest our citizens share. So I do not see shifts in policies for one member state or the other leaving or joining, and I do not see an impact of uh, the UK leaving the Euro European Union in two years from now when it comes to foreign or defence policy. I don't see this. First, because the uh, impact of the UK contributions both to our foreign and our defence policy is not that relevant. You look at the numbers, you see it very clearly. And because uh, we have, I believe, a common interest, both on our side and on the UK side, in the future, to continue to work together under the NATO umbrella, in terms of military cooperation, in terms of uh, development uh, uh, cooperation in the UN um, context. I think that the UK and the European Union in the future will find a way to develop a partnership on foreign and security policy that will continue to be cooperative. But I can tell you, you take out of the foreign and security policy of the European Union, the UK piece of the puzzle, this will not affect our global policy. And what I'm seeing in our partners' reaction to uh, this beginning of negotiations, we've started now, well, we've not started yet, but we have started to prepare, we're waiting for the elections uh, in, in the UK, is a clear understanding from China to India to Brazil to Canada to the United States to South Africa, to you name it, clear understanding that 27 is more than one. It's not difficult to understand. Let me just ask you about the transatlantic relationship before I take some um, questions from, from the audience. Um, even under Obama, there was already starting to be some nervousness from US allies, not just in Europe, but, but also in Europe, about uh, America's commitment to them. Um, but obviously, since the election of Trump, um, we're now in a completely different uh, uh, place in terms of the um, radical uncertainty about the US security guarantee. Um, first of all, you have this idea that NATO should be, that is, that is obsolete, it should be repurposed to focus not on a 20th century problem, i.e. Russia, but a 21st century problem, i.e. terrorism. This is the, 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 the view, the Trump view. Um, and secondly, um, this idea that um, the security guarantee becomes conditional in a way that it never was on the amount that individual countries uh, spend uh, on defense, uh, uh, in particular the 2% um, target. Um, is that not a radical game changer for the EU as well? In particular, when you read the EU, when you read the global strategy, which you published last year, and I reread it on the, the plane over here, um, uh, it you does, had a long flight. <laughs> I, I did have a long flight, but actually it's a quick read. It's a very quick read. Um, uh, but um, it, it is entirely premised on the idea that NATO is the um, bedrock of European security, particularly in terms of territorial defence, and that the US is there, and that what the EU essentially seeks to do is to complement that. Um, does it not now need to be completely rewritten after Brexit, but particularly after Trump? No, not at all. Uh, actually... Uh, you know, many were um, wondering whether it was wise to publish the global strategy a uh, couple of days after the Brexit uh, referendum took place, and even more so after the US elections. Actually, if you read it as you've done uh, now, uh, you see that there's much more than the idea of complementing NATO. First of all, NATO being the bedrock of European security, 
is still something the European Union believes. And according to the official US positions, we hear, and I have personally heard many times uh, from the administration, being it the vice president that visited Brussels, both the European Union and NATO headquarters, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, uh, um, National Security Advisor, you constantly hear this message also from the United States new administration. And I think the symbolism, but here I don't want to play NATO's role. I mean, you have uh, excellent people that can do that uh, uh, instead of me, but the very same fact that President Trump comes to Brussels to inaugurate the new um, NATO headquarters and to have uh, meetings with the Euro European Union at the same time is a clear indication of the level of commitment and trust that is there beyond some of the rhetorics that we heard in the past. Uh, we are seeing shifts. Uh, from what was said in the uh, electoral campaign and what is the policy that is announced today. We might see shifts coming up in the future, could be, but what we hear today and what we see today is clear commitment. But apart from that, for, for the European Union, NATO continues to be the bedrock of uh, European security, but what you find in the global strategy, what you find in the work we have done on European defence since July last year to today, and what we will continue to do, hopefully, with, again, as I said, important decisions to be taken from now to the end of the year under the Estonian presidency is much more than complementing NATO. It's complementing because most of the challenges we're facing and the threats we're facing today go beyond a purely and only military approach. The hybrid threats require a set of tools that the European Union has. We have to strengthen our hard power, but we have a lot of other instruments we can use. But there is also the idea that Europeans have to do more for their own security. And here, I do not enter in the 2% debate, which is not a European Union debate, it's a national debate for NATO allies. But there is one thing that the European Union can do to help those member states of the European Union that are also NATO allies and that want to invest better in defense, and that is the economy of scale. I often quote, one number, I'm sorry, I apologize for those of you that uh, have heard me saying this uh, 10 times. Americans invest 50%, uh, no, Europeans invest 50% of what Americans invest in defense. Five zero. The European output on defense is 15%, one five. Why? Because we invest in a fragmented manner. What the European Union can do, and only the European Union can do, is provide the member states that, by the way, most of them are also NATO allies, the space, the instruments, the incentives to invest together on defense, including on capabilities, so that we have a much more effective output, uh, even if we keep the same amount of money. Imagine if then we increase the level of, amount of money we invest. This means spending better, that after such an economic crisis we've faced is not irrelevant, given the stress our budgets have always faced in these recent years. But most of all, it means that the Europeans can finally, finally find an economy of scale for their industrial basis for defense, for their research programs. And this would finally provide the basis for European defense. This is something that only the European Union can do and then will benefit member states, NATO, our American friends, and our security and the security of our citizens. This is exactly what we're doing now using the instruments that the European Union already has, but has never used. But I think you use, in the, in, the, in, the, in the global strategy document, I think you use the phrase, an appropriate level of strategic autonomy. We work on that sentence for uh, <laughs> six. So, so, <laughs> my, my question is, what, what is the appropriate level? And, and you're, is it, is you're, it, you're good in spotting that. <laughs> and, and is it the, the same level as, as, as before the election of Trump? Um, or, or do we now have a different level of ambition in terms of what kind of strategic autonomy um, we want? That's a good question. But you see, the global strategy has the right flexibility uh, to determine what is the appropriate level of strategic autonomy we will need. The answer is not an answer we can determine alone it will continue to depend very much on what kind of determination NATO has and will have on the European security. For the moment, I have to say, the important thing for us is to keep NATO focused on the European defense. At the same time, we have as Europeans, first, to do more and better on our own defense and security. Second, 
we have our own European way of doing security. This is not what normally it is, is technically meant by level of strategic autonomy. It, it, it is a, a purely military terminology, and you know very well in this room, all of you, what it refers to. But there's a, there's a more, I would say, even philosophical approach. I'm sorry, you're watching. No, 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 I didn't. There's a more philosophical approach, which is very concrete, actually, as philosophy often is. Uh, there's a European way to security that is never purely and only military. You take any crisis or any security threat in the world of today, and you realize that the hard power, the military means, are always necessary, but never enough. And the European Union has this unique mix of hard power that needs to be increased, because it's not enough, what we have now, but we have at the same time the soft power. And this unique mix, if we manage to increase our hard power, position ourselves in a place that can be very helpful for our partners in the world to tackle some security issues. I give you an example. Take the Sahel, one of the places where security threats are now more dangerous. There you will have to train the security forces of countries, take Mali, provide economic opportunities for the youth so that they are less exposed to radicalization, fight the smugglers' networks of people, arms and drugs, because that finances the terrorist networks, so you need police capacity, you need the satellite uh, images to monitor desert spaces, and that is something we have in our uh, satellite uh, center in Spain, and I could continue like this, which means that there is not any more, or not only, anymore the typical warfare of last century. Military power is needed, but you also need the mix with soft power, intelligence, sometimes a lot of digital, uh, work to be done, and here um, I, I stop because uh, this is the, the, the motherland uh, of digital, so whatever I say is inappropriate. Um, the humanitarian, the development, uh, even the climate change work is security work now. Um, in Somalia, the droughts are pushing a thousand, if not hundreds of thousands of people uh, in desperation, which gives Al Shabaab a large access to people that are desperate and can turn into terrorists that can feed into a network that then can link to terrorist organizations' presence either in Libya or Boko Haram in Nigeria. The world is complex and there is not one single instrument that will make it. So I think that the work we have ahead of us is huge, but we have, if we're self-confident and we take the political courage to use the potential we have, we could be indeed the security provider that not only the Europeans but also our region and more largely the world needs in partnership. Because this is also the European way. As we want to partner with NATO, we also want to partner with others. The UN when it comes to peacekeeping in the Horn of Africa. Uh, our friends in Asia when it comes to the South China Sea or uh, yeah. the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And the list can continue. But the European Union is the only power in the world that has this mix of instruments and has the understanding of complexity because we have complexity inside. Right. There's lots of other things I'd love to ask you about, including economic power, which can also be a form of hard, hard power. Um, but I want to give the audience um, a chance to, to ask you some, some questions as well. So we'll maybe take three, if that's, if that's okay, uh, and then see if we have time for, for, for a second round. The, the gentleman here to start with. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Breiser, formerly of ICDS, now the Atlanta Council. Live in Istanbul, so obvious question. Does Turkey have leverage over the EU on the migrant issue? Uh, or how much should they overplay that? Thank you. Okay, and then James Shah. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. You have spoken in very reassuring terms about the relationship between the EU and NATO and between hard power and soft power. But uh, it, it is clear that Brexit, which I have opposed as much as anyone in this room, 
is reviving in some quarters discussion of a European defense independent of NATO, and I think it needs to be clearly understood the obstacle to this has not been the United Kingdom. The obstacle has been the challenge of creating from scratch the institutions and command arrangements which have matured inside NATO for 70 years. So my question to you is your assessment of the extent to which the practical impossibility of meeting this challenge is now well understood by uh, by EU member states. And then Michael behind James. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Halsell from Johns Hopkins University in Washington. Uh, I agree with you, um, Madam High Commissioner, that the mix of security that the, US, that the EU has is unique, but I would say it's a recent development, namely about three and a half months old. Uh, I say with the deepest regret that one of the results of the Trump presidency so far has been the shedding of our advantage, namely the ability to inspire others. I think we had the mix before then. But the question I would ask has to do with a part of Europe that you didn't mention, namely the Western Balkans. And this uh, is an area which is still volatile, some would say, more than it has been in the past decade. My question is simply, uh, the big carrot that the EU has always had is the promise of membership for several of the countries there, Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, the, the union has now said that in the short term it's not gonna be enlarging anymore. Doesn't this basically uh, harm the whole security uh, structure that you were talking about? Great, and I'm gonna take one more if that's okay, because I don't think we're gonna have time for a second round. Liana. Thank you very much, Liana Fix from Cover Foundation. Um, Hi, Commissioner, we are now in year three of the Minsk process without any results. It seems that as if it is still 2014. Is it now time for the European Union to get involved in conflict resolution in Eastern Ukraine beyond what the European Union is doing right now, for instance, by expanding the Normandy format. Would you still leave it to France and Germany, or is there something the EU can do? Thank you. Great. So I was expecting lots of questions about Russia, but we've only had one. Um, so Turkey, Western Balkans, NATO again, and then Minsk and conflict resolution, Ukraine. Yes, uh, Turkey. I would say that the European Union has a leverage on Turkey. The Turkish economy depends on the European Union. Um, the Turkish security uh, depends on NATO. Uh, it's not the European Union, but uh, that's clearly the hook to the West. Uh, I have always refused, and I will always continue to refuse, to see our relations with Turkey uh, purely and only through the angle of the refugee crisis. First of all, because I am among those Europeans convinced that we can manage. Uh, you take a country like Niger, one of the poorest country in the world, uh, hosting 700,000 refugees. Come on, we can make it. Second, because the work we're doing with Turkey on the Syrian refugees is exactly the same work we're doing with Jordan and Lebanon. We are supporting not Turkey, but we're supporting the refugees in, hosted in Turkey currently through the UN agencies, through the international NGOs, and we will continue to do that because this is an investment and first of all, the possibility for us to solve the Syrian crisis, because if all the Syrians will be gone, uh, there will be no Syrians to go back and reconstruct the country. And second, because for every child that doesn't go to school uh, of the Syrian new generation, we will have probably a generation that will be exposed to terrorism in the future. So it's an investment in our own interest and security. Uh, with Turkey, we have an accession process going on. Turkey is an important candidate country and as such uh, has clear uh, understanding of the criteria that are there to enter the European Union. Uh, and is continuing to say that it's interested in coming in. And so we take it for what it says and we engage, knowing very clearly that this means clear human rights standards, fundamental freedoms, including the freedom of media, uh, rule of law, and I could continue. But for us, the partnership, the relation with Turkey goes well beyond uh, its uh, candidate status. Uh, Turkey is also a major regional partner when it comes to the crisis in Syria, when it comes to the issue of Cyprus, 
when it comes to energy cooperation, when it comes to counterterrorism, and I could continue. Uh, or the crisis in Libya, by the way. Uh, so um, I've always said the work we do on refugees is not a purely Turkish issue, and the work we do with Turkey is not a purely refugee issue. Uh, EU defense independent from NATO. This is not an EU temptation. Not now that the UK has decided to leave, nor before, not afterwards. Uh, but this cannot be um, taken as a pretext not to move on the European defence. I think that we've been for decades, literally decades, blocked uh, by our own ghosts. Uh, this is a copyright I owe to Stoltenberg uh, that uh, told me a few months ago, actually, at the beginning of the, this common work we've done, in the most difficult moment, I have to say we helped each other because uh, uh, we understood that from our side, from my side, it was important to reassure the NATO allies that we were not duplicating or competing. And from his side, he had to assure the European Union member states that this was helpful also for NATO. And we did this work together. But this, now that we have cleared the table from the ghosts of the past. This doesn't mean that uh, we have to stick to the alibis that Europeans had in the past. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the UK deciding to leave. To me, the point is this, and I like the militaries because they're practical people. Uh, you start from the needs you have. Uh, behind your words, there was the headquarters issue uh, coming up. To all those that were telling me in the past months, you don't want to establish a European Union headquarters, do you? I said, you know what? We have already many headquarters because we're running military operations. And for running a military operations, you need headquarters. Otherwise, who commands? The point is that we have a fragmented system of headquarters. And in military practical terms, this is not always the most effective way of running a military operation or a military mission or to coordinate the military and civilian military opera uh, civilians operations and missions. So what we're doing is not a shape kind of headquarters or a duplication or, or a EU duplication of a military alliance. The European Union is not a military alliance and doesn't want to become one. But we want to make a more effective use of the instruments and the resources we have. We owe it to our taxpayers, which are our citizens. So this is the work we're doing. Very pragmatic, very practical. What we need to do to make the European work on defence work better, be more effective. Uh, Western Balkans. I am among those that uh, have said and continue to say, and will continue to say, that if we are honest, uh, where are you? Uh, I, yes, yeah, sorry. If we are honest, intellectually honest, uh, we have to say that the future of the European Union will not be at 27. Because for one member that will go out in two years from now, we will have new members coming in. Otherwise, what are we negotiating about with the Western Balkans? And Turkey, by the way. But Turkey has a reflection ongoing in, inside. In the Western Balkans, the level of trust of the public opinion in the European Union is around 70%, 7-0. It's, uh, it's numbers that we dream of in our member states. Maybe not here. <laughs> <laughs> Good, <laughs> I'll stay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this to say that the European, if there is one place where the European Union can make the difference and has the responsibility to make the difference, that's the Western Balkans. And I believe that we have done in the last two years, uh, for each of the Western Balkans six, so many steps in the direction of the European Union perspective that if you give me other two years of work at this same space, we will finish the mandate of this commission in 2019, having made irreversible the road of all the Western Balkan six to the European Union. And this will be the only guarantee for security and peace in the region. Because I'm, it's true, it's still a volatile and turbulent area. Uh, every single place in the Balkans, in the Western Balkans, has a political problem ongoing. But, the clear key to these political problems is the common belonging to the European continent and to the European Union family eventually. And the clear determination is that one. So I was particularly glad that uh, the European Council, and uh, the Prime Minister knows it well, uh, last time we met at 28, uh, 
uh, we came out with a clear commitment uh, to the European perspective of the Western Balkans, because that is the level we need of commitment. Heads of state and government saying to our friends in the Western Balkans that want to come in, the door is open. But Mr Juncker has sent somewhat different signals, no? Two years and a half ago, uh, the President of the Commission uh, said to the European Parliament there will be no new member uh, within the next five years, which created uh, quite a, a wave of shock in the region. Uh, but then when I discussed this with our friends in the region, each of them, asking them very openly, do you think you would be ready to come in as a full member in five years' time or four years' time? They say, obviously not. They said, so, you see, the, the point is, get to the end of this mandate of this commission, get to 2019, being ready to enter the day after. Would you be ready to do that? This means using all the transformational power, as we say, of the accession negotiations, and for some of them, it's not even started. But get ready for that, and next day, you will have a president of the commission that will tell you, you can enter tomorrow, but you have to be ready for that. So my, uh, my objective, and maybe here comes the fact that being Italian, you know, the Adriatic is a small lake. Uh, <laughs> we are part of the same region, but if, the, if all the Western Balkans are serious, in making the changes, the structural changes that are needed and their population wants to see, we can be serious in having a new wave of member states afterwards. I know this is not a popular discourse in some of our member states, but I think it's our interest, European interest, to go in that direction. And then we will see how the process will go. But I can tell you the only way of having the Balkans, the entire Balkans, in peace and cooperating with each other and economically cooperating with each other is exactly the same way in which we managed to come out of thousands of years of European wars yeah. when we realized that making business together was more convenient than making war. It started like that 60 years ago. Yeah. We realized that making trade uh, among countries that had always been fighting each other was much more convenient for our citizens. It's very pragmatic. I owe yes, uh, the answer to Minsk. Ukraine, yes, exactly. very briefly. Uh, we have already started to do that. Uh, first of all, I would like to say the uh, French and German presence in the MISC, uh, uh, in, in the Normandy format, is very much a European Union uh, presence. They do relate to our Foreign Affairs Council regularly, uh, creating this link and bringing to that table, uh, that by the way is a complicated table, uh, European Union positions constantly. The format started before I came in. Um, I'm not particularly happy of having, um, let's say, this kind of approach, but I think the important thing for now is to help the process to deliver something. That is more important than the format itself for me. And you know very well, the crisis started uh, with a certain perception of the European Union around it. Uh, you have to be sure you're part of the solution if you want to contribute to the solution to come. At the moment, I think uh, the important thing is to push for, uh, not only to push, but also to help uh, delivering on the MISC implementation. To support the French and the Germans in this difficult exercise, to help our Ukrainian friends to deliver on their side, which is a complicated exercise, and to push on the Russians to deliver on their side, uh, which is a difficult exercise for a different reason. <laughs> uh, one additional element of the European Union role that sometimes we forget, but it's key, two others. One is the support we give to the OSCE. The OSCE is a key organization and it has proven to be a key organization in this crisis. And the European Union is giving the support to the OSCE, including on the mining, which is fundamental for the saving lives of the people. Sometimes you don't get the picture or the headline, but to me it's more important the kind of work you manage to do, practically. Uh, I prefer to manage to do the work and not get the headline, rather than getting the headline and not managing to do the work. Maybe it's a women attitude, I don't know, but I prefer the real things rather than the visibility. Sometimes you also need the visibility. The second thing we're doing, and it's vital, is the support to the Ukrainians, because the real bet I believe, was that the Ukrainian uh, state would have collapsed from the inside. 
And this is not happening because we are supporting the reform process inside Ukraine. And those inside Ukraine that have a reform agenda tackling the core structural problems that were also partially at the basis of the Maidan uh, demonstrations. This is a vital role that the European Union is playing. So in some crises, uh, you need to be the one that facilitates the talks. In some other crises, you have to understand what is the best possible contribution you give to the solution and play in team. And this is exactly what we're doing now. Are there, going different, are there going to be different conditions in the future? It could be. And if that is the case, we will need to keep flexible and adjust. But with the core um, guiding principle that for us, the purpose is not getting the picture or getting a place in the picture, uh, but the core guiding principle for us is trying to help Ukraine getting out of the crisis and trying to have whoever sits at the table uh, having the right instruments uh, to move on on the implementation. And this requires carrots and sticks, as uh, people like to call it. And the European Union has some uh, that is using, including the sanctions. The future will bring us something else? We will see. That reminds me of the Robert Cooper quote about um, the EU uh, speaking softly and carrying a large carrot. <laughs> um, I, I wish... I wish I, I wish we could continue. You know, I've, start, I've started to, uh, to, to, to use uh, our uh, power in a different manner. I'm surprising myself uh, also because it's not my character. Uh, I'm going around the world uh, saying something similar to, you know what, we're paying a lot of money. So are you seeing that? Okay, do you want to continue seeing that? Okay, so, you know, you have a couple of things you need to do. It's, it's the power of soft power. You, you were mentioning, someone mentioning, uh, the hard power of economy. That's the biggest power we have. The biggest power we have. I wish we could continue, particularly on that subject, but I've already eaten into the next panel, which is being chaired by Edward Lucas. But thank you very much for coming, and in particular, thank you, thank you. for not... <laughs> thank you. Thank you for not giving a speech and being willing to engage in a, in a conversation, which was great fun. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Just while the uh, technical... Um, preparations are being finalized. I will introduce myself and the panelists and the subject. Um, Madam President, Prime Ministers and so on. It's, um, Estonia is a country where people um, speak rather briefly but they really mean what they say and that applies to um, compliments and introductions as well. So I will just say that it's wonderful to be here at yet another Lennart Mary conference and to see so many distinguished um, people and so many great friends in the audience. Um, those of you who have seen the original version of the um, program may be a bit puzzled because I'm not Constance Stelzenmüller um, in many ways. Um, and she is on her way here and you will have a chance to see her. I think she's chairing a night owl session later on. Um, I also um, want to say as the Brit on the panel that I'm really sorry about Brexit. And <laughs> I... Um, we're not done yet. We don't know what, how bad it's going to be. We don't know when it's going to be. There is still a flicker of hope that it may be a long way in the future and not that bad. Um, as Yuri Lewick said in his excellent opening remarks, um, darkness before dawn, uh, but things are a lot less dark than they were six months ago. We no longer feel there's a tide of populism sweeping across the world, sweeping everything um, before it. I, I don't know whether this pause we're in is a breathing space or maybe just the last gasp of the liberal order, but at least we have a chance to think about what we're going to do and maybe even to do it. So on that note, I'm delighted to introduce our panellists who've now got their um, microphones on. Um, President Kajaled of Estonia needs uh, no introduction, but it's fantastic to have you here at the um, Lennart Mary Conference, um, Madam President, dear Kirsty. Um, Prime Minister Enrico Letta of, um, of Italy and uh, Knut Abraham, who I have to say has more Estonian things in his office even than I do in my office. My, <laughs> office, my office looks like the souvenir shop at Tallinn Airport, sure. but <laughs> Knut's office um, beats me by some, by, by, by some, by some way. Um, we're gonna, um, we've been given an extra 15 minutes, um, which will eat slightly into our, our dinner, so I will finish it quarter past six rather than six. So I hope to have time to take a couple of 
um, questions from the floor. But without any further ado, I'm going to go first of all to President Kailed. What do we need to do? Should we be going for more integration and for more discipline and accelerate um, the processes that have been going on in the EU? Is it time for more flexibility and for more imagination? Is that the le lesson of Brexit? Um, Estonia is a small country, but it is a digital and, to some extent, intellectual superpower when it comes to these things. We have very high expectations from Estonians as both people who um, point out our weaknesses and give us good ideas about what we should be doing. Over to you, Madam President. Thank you, Ed. I'm now dying to seek, not office, because Ed, Ed, after all, has the office where vegetables are named after Estonian politicians. So uh, that's, that's a long true. shot yeah. that yours is, uh, is more Estonian looking. I'm dying to see. <laughs> Thank you, Ed, for that introduction. Uh, Indeed, uh, we're known for straight talking, and, uh, and maybe that's the reason why you see European Union so popular uh, in Estonia. Uh, the main reason it is popular is that for 25 years our message has been uh, relatively coherent. Uh, we have never said that the European Union is good from one hand, but from the other hand, uh, of course, the European Union has so many problems and it's keeping the governments from developing uh, our country. Quite to the contrary, we've always said that the European Union is an enabler for member states' governments but our governments have kept the responsibility to develop Estonia within the European Union. And as you can see, this actually uh, pays off, or to turn it around, it's not cheap to blame Brussels on everything, which is the lesson which uh, people have uh, hopefully learned. And uh, to make my point stronger, I would also turn to the French elections and, and say that uh, Emmanuel Macron, what he did, he was honest and sin sincere about what the European Union is given to us Europeans, and that helped to win him effectively a referendum on the European issues. And it's not empty words that Europe is, positive Europe is functioning and there's nothing fundamentally wrong with our Europe. A few examples. Uh, since 2004, every country par one has gotten richer than it was at the point of big enlargement. Everybody, not only the new member states. Mm -hmm. They are indeed 1.9 times richer on average, but everybody else is doing better as well. All our uh, common policies have been tried and tested through these 10 years of, uh, well, difficult times, which uh, we like to call crisis. None of the European policies have been found to be unnecessary. And in none of our policies have the re reaction of the European Union been withdrawal. Quite to the contrary, if you look at the euro area, it comes out of the financial crisis stronger because obviously it was easier to find political consensus to create the right instruments during the period of crisis, which showed what were the deficiencies of the original plan. Same is now happening to Schengen. Through this migration crisis, which we are having also sadly through the terrorist attacks, we are learning that Schengen external border needs to be protected so that in real time we can exchange information about who is in and who is out. Suddenly, all the issues about is it safe to have so much information in databases, do we want to share this information, is all gone. It's about safety, it's guaranteeing that the Schengen internal borders can remain open. Again, you see a development, you do not see a withdrawal. Wherever you look at the operative decisions we've had to take, take Article 50, how swiftly did we come up with a common position for Article 50 negotiations. Take Ukraine. Quite quickly, we had a consensus mm -hmm. over the sanctions, and we have been keeping this consensus. There is absolutely no reason, if you look at the hard facts, to say that the European Union is in crisis, the European Union is not functioning, the European Union is terribly deficient, our policies, well, are misguided, Nothing's perfect. The world is not perfect, but to have perfect, you probably have to die and go to heaven and hope there is a heaven to find perfect. <laughs> That's the Estonian message, if you, if you so wish. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, our union is still in need of development. It always will be, because the global situation, the world around us is changing all the time. The world's never ready, Europe's never ready. And this is what we need to keep in mind. I'm so tired of hearing in all conferences I go for last half year, Europe's in crisis. Yes, let's take ourselves together, talk about what has gone right and continue from where we are. We are not in a crisis, even not in an economic crisis. We can do together 
much better than we could do bilaterally. That's, I mean, not worth even mentioning. But nobody mentions it, and that's a big problem. There is no alternative, simply. And that is why I am uh, quite confident that uh, already during the Estonian presidency, if we Estonians are careful not to get too tangled in delivering everything digital, we will deliver everything digital too, <laughs> I can promise you. Because in all policies of European Union, now there are digital aspects. Europe is a digital society without recognizing it, we recognize it. So we will deliver on those issues as well. But what we also want to have is that in a year from now, people will look back at the Estonian presidency and they will say, this is the time when the ice started to break. This is the time when we concentrated on our future. We took the Juncker paper, we took all the hard facts, we recognized and realized that nothing's materially wrong, and we came out of it stronger together. Thank you. Well, thanks very much indeed uh, for that, Kerstin, and for, um, and I, I, I know that Estonia wanted to have its presidency in time for the 100th birthday, and that's just another consequence of Brexit. You've, you, you've taken over um, what would have been the British uh, presidency, but we are all looking forward to it very much nonetheless. So I'd like to go to Mr. Mr. Letter now, because I think Kerstin has uh, highlighted the, the different sort of entities we have within the EU. There's Schengen land, which needs to worry about security and its internal and its external border. We also have what you might call Euro land, which is the countries that use um, the Euro. And we have what one might call free market land, the, you know, the, the wider legal space governed by the, um, the Commission. And each of those pinches quite hardly, um, quite hard on Italy. You, have, you are a Schengen frontier. Um, you've got the difficulties of the of, of the Eurozone and, the, and, 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 slow, and very slow growth. Um, and I'd be very, we'd be very interested to hear your perspective. Do you share President Kyled's optimism that this is going to be the, the time when the European Union gets to grips with its problems and actually, start, actually starts doing something? I think it, it, it was very important to hear this uh, very, very strong optimism, first of all, because of you and because of your presidency. There's many expectations for Estonian presidency next uh, semester. And I think the, the slogan that you uh, decided to have, this uh, unity through balance, is a very important one, is the, is the right slogan for the future. And I think also for, for this conference, the timing that you decided to have four days after the French elections and some weeks before the starting of your semester, uh, is, is, very, is really crucial, because I completely share your point. You know, I'm, I'm an Italian, today working in, Fran in France, leading a French uh, cultural university institution, and now being here in Tallinn, so is, is Europe. I'm so sorry, because you are the, the only one left standing without a chair, so maybe it's, it's your British situation that is... <laughs> <laughs> On the side. <laughs> Uh, but we, we can share if you want. <laughs> but, but, you know, the point is that the French elections were, for my point of view, is not because I am in France now or because Macron is, is a student of my university, was a student of my university, Sciences Po, <laughs> but because uh, it was really a turning point after Brexit and Trump. It was a turning point for what I think for one clear reason. I think that Brexit and Trump, two different subjects, but linked for what I think in, for, for one word, and the word was the past. I was very much shocked by the two slogans, Brexiters take back control, back, and Trump make America great again, again. Uh, I, it is the first time that somebody, someone, wins elections uh, proposing the past and not the future. That is impressive. Macron won proposing the future and not the past. Not only because he's young or because he's very dynamic, but because also the, the ideas for the future. And I think this, this point is decisive and also the, the strength and the big support of all the people, 20 million, 66% uh, winning and defeating the old parties in France, giving him a big personal mandate 
to convince the Germans, to convince the Germans, because yes. the key point will be how Macron will be able, of course, after the 24 of September, to convince the Germans that it is possible to move. It is possible to move without their, I, I think, legitimate fears about the attitude of some Latin friends, and I put Italy among these Latin friends, and about the fact that we want to share uh, economic policies, investments, but we want to share, first of all, and I put Italians and French together, we want to share the fact that the European Union is the two values together, responsibility and solidarity. You can't isolate one, let the other out. Responsibility and solidarity. In a world and in a European Union in which I think what is the most important and the most difficult thing, and I think the true European social fatigue, the, the cleavages, we are experiencing two, uh, three main cleavages. The, f the first one, uh, it was in, in the French elections, but it's, it was also in the, in the Brexit elections, the, the difference between cities and countryside. When I see the result in Paris of the French elections, when Macron won 85 to 15 instead of the 66 to 34, and, when, and, and where uh, Le Pen in the first uh, round took 5%, and the same in Bordeaux or in Lyon, it seems to be the same result that Brexit had in the big cities. It is exactly the same point. And the other main point is about uh, the cleavage between young people and aged people. I was really shocked by the, the, the fears on the, on the Brexit result, because you know very well the fact that people bef uh, between 18 and, and 24, 75% in favor of remain. And people uh, more than 65, 39% uh, for remain. And, and what shocked me on, on the point on young and, and age society, society was the fact that in, in my university we have many British students. They were crying the day after, but they were crying because they didn't vote. That was terrible, the fact that the aged population with a big turnout and the, and, the, and the young population with a very low turnout. I think this is a key point, a key point also in the discussion we are having in, in the other countries. In, in France it was the same. There's a different attitude. And the different attitude changes for what is linked to southern countries with unemployment, the raise of unemployment. And this is why the key point, maybe I, I shift to the, to the euro and the economic matters more than, than the security and I end up here immediately. I think the key point is that we have to create a link between euro and growth. And we have to create in the next steps, in the next discussions and in the next decisions, the possibility for the euro to be considered by the people as a tool to create growth and to beat unemployment. Yeah. That was not the case in, uh, until now. Until now, the euro was considered as uh, a, a tool without balance. I, I take your, the point and the slogan of your presidency, unity through balance. And we have to put balance into the euro too. Balance between uh, solidarity and responsibility, between growth and investment. The fact that divergence today is a, is a great problem in Europe. So. I think we are uh, today entering a semester in which after the German elections, there's a large, great, really important, I would say unique window of opportunity for uh, Europe. So we have to take this window of opportunity and I'm sure that the Estonian presidency will be the engine to do that. Thank you. Well, thanks very much indeed. You, you've come up with several really interesting um, dichotomies or, or pairs of ideas, the solidarity versus responsibility, the urban-rural split, the 
past versus the future, young versus old. I don't think they overlap exactly, because as far as I remember, I think in the French result, the young people were voting more for uh, Le Pen than for Macron. Which was and Mélenchon. And Mélenchon. Yeah. Um, but um, th th these, are, these are very useful ways of looking at it. Um, I'm, I feel it's slightly unfair on Knut that these, your, your, your speech, your remarks, would be an excellent um, springboard for, to give a great grilling to Mr. Schäuble, but Mr. Schäuble isn't here. <laughs> and um, and um, Knut Abraham works in the, for Mrs. Merkel, but his speciality is not economic and financial policy, and so I don't think we can expect you to give any detailed response to Mr. Letters, um, uh, Mr. Letters' thoughts. You, you, you're, you're, you basically run Ostpolitik for Mrs. Uh, Merkel, the, um, the relations right. with, the, with the countries of the East. Right. But you still do work in the most important building in the most important city, in the most important country in Europe. Um, <laughs> well, so, so, give, so, give, so how, how does it look from the Kanzler? Well, uh, thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's quite a difficult uh, position for me here, but also for, for Germany. It's, it's, I, I feel the weight, by the way, here. Um, it's still a new position for our country. So you might have seen that I'd been posted to DC for a couple of years and reading the papers every morning, uh, saying Germany, the leading country of Europe. What do you do as an embassy? Germany, leading country. No, 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 no. We have Brussels, uh, things like that. And then I returned in, in 2015, came back to Berlin, and of course I'm, I'm careful enough n not to confirm the word the, but we, we, we feel the weight. And why is it so? And it's a, a simple truth, just, just one second. Please remember our geographic position. We are member of everything. So me personally, very close to Estonia because I'm from Schleswig-Holstein and many other reasons too. My, my friends and colleagues in Bavaria don't really care about Baltic politics. They are part of this very vibrant economic zone, northern Italy, Switzerland, Baden-Württemberg, Bavaria. So we are in, you can go to the west, uh, to the Catholic regions, or my family, me, Berlin, Brandenburg, we are part of Central Europe. So the best, and this is our deep conviction, is the best in Germany's national interest. We are convinced Europeans, but the best for, for Germany is working European institutions. You can study that, and I, I don't go into details, with some bilateral aspects in, of the last month. We are so grateful to have the European level and the shared European values on which we can put the discussion and not have it bilaterally with some neighbors. That is of extreme importance. But what, what does it mean? This means uh, we are looking First of all, uh, we need to strengthen the institutions. This is very important, talking about Europe in such a positive way. This is a responsibility too, and this, is, um, this means not harming the European institutions, but fostering them and strengthening them. Secondly, continue our enlargement policy, which was already debated. I can only underline that. And thirdly, uh, with a special view to car build, um, engage in Eastern Partnership, and you have the, the, the summit, uh, the summit in, in November. But we are also on, on, on the level somewhere in between looking for, for partners, um, given again the, these, these geographic position we are, we are in, who share, and this is certainly true for Italy, uh, who share in France, uh, share this um, responsibility for, for it all, for, for, it, for it all. And this brings me to, to, to the point of migration. So I heard um, a, a top politician from a neighboring country, Germany, um, speaking uh, the day before yesterday and telling us his country uh, has n nothing to manage in the migration question. But is the influx of a thousand people or 800 people every day in Italy, 300 on the from coming from the Balkans. This is not an Italian problem. And the refugees in Germany is not only a German problem. We need this 
sense of responsibility for these for these um, new new challenges too, and maybe we can uh, debate that during during the conference. And uh, maybe two 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 final points uh, from my side. We have, of course, to press on critics. I absolutely share, Madam President, uh, what, what what you said. We have to press on the critics. So, for example, I have never heard a convincing <coughs> argument on what what competences should really be, be brought back from the European level to the national level. On the theoretical level, uh, everyone says, oh yes, subsidiarity, we have to do that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to details, I've never heard anyone, may, maybe we can, can discuss that during the conference. So press the critics and of course spread the news. We have to do a lot more about communication. I'm sure we can learn a lot of the modern modern techniques you're using here in Estonia, it's not that the ambassador is going out and make a speech pro-Europe. Yeah? Um, we need much more modern ways of, of spreading the news. And, and this is not only the task for the European institutions, but also for all of us. I was, of course, preparing, and now, of course, I lost, no, here. How can the EU win back the trust of its member governments and their citizens? How can the EU win back the trust of its member governments? I mean, we are the EU. We are the EU. Uh, it's our task to do that. So invest in communications. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks. For <laughs> thanks very much, Dean. Of course, one of the points about communications is dealing with the other side's communications. And we're going to have a panel to discuss disinformation and yeah. fake news um, tomorrow, which is a, still a, very, is a, a hotter topic than ever, perhaps, after the French elections. Well, we've got 27 minutes and uh, one second uh, for, until we have to break, so there's plenty of time for discussion. I'd like to commend all the panellists for keeping their um, remarks so short. Um, please do stick your hand up if you would like to ask a question or say something, and please forgive me if I don't recognise you, because I've got the interrogation lights in my eyes. Um, which means I can see movement, but not necessarily outlines. Um, but I've got a question for all of the panel while you're sharpening yours, which is, what do we do to rebuild trust? It seems to me that there, and there's plenty of very good sociological data showing that we are becoming steadily less trustful societies. Um, it's happening in terms of um, the way individuals trust each other. It's also trust in institutions at every level. We are uh, even high-trust societies are becoming less trust, trusting and, and low trust societies, which we also have um, in Europe, um, are um, heading down to rock bottom trust levels. There's, lo there's lots of data about this. And we, are, we, the people in this room, the people who go to conferences, the people who read The Economist, or in my case, write for The Economist, you know, this is quite largely our fault. We've been running the world since 1991. We can no longer say, do what we want, otherwise um, the communists will come. Of course, in Estonia, they're already here. Um, but we, we and, and, and I think we've really missed a trick. The trust is ebbing year by year by year. And I'd just like to ask all three members of the panel, um, reflecting on the title, The War on Trust, and uh, how to win it. How do we regain trust? President Kaled. Well, one thing is you need to deliver what you promised. Very important thing. And indeed, I mentioned already that uh, member states have tried to put the blame for what they did not deliver on Brussels. Quite common, but not free it appears. But there's another element where institutions themselves are actually guilty. Because if you think back, let's say, 10 years maybe, even slightly more now, you come to this discussion, Europe should be so close to everybody in Europe, close to every 500 million people. And the quintessence of that is let's buy train tickets for young people so they can travel around Europe. Sorry. Europe is a difficult legal construct which delivers mainly through our uh, active verbal combat in Justus Lipsus building. That's the honest way to put it. But what did I hear in 2004, 5, 6 as an auditor of the European Union? European Union cohesion policy created 600,000 jobs when the jobs started to disappear because the growth faltered. Nobody said the opposite. It was not the European Union who delivered those jobs. It was the European Union policy which helped <coughs> member states' government to take responsibility and deliver mm -hmm. those jobs. Mm -hmm. Europe will never deliver to every single person 
among 500 million. And indeed, I agree with you that uh, there is no, uh, well, big things to take back to the member state level. On the other hand, if you look uh, at the European Union spending and the attention it pays on really tiny issues, which would be much better actually handled at the local government level, and I'm not even meaning, meaning member state government level, Europe is handling lots of projects which deal with early school leaving, children on the street, all these kind of things. I'm sorry, that's none of the business of the European Union. It shouldn't try to play the super nanny state. It will make promises which are empty and will not deliver. So I believe that we need to create more room for our action on solidarity. And by this, I don't only mean solidarity among member states, but I'm from coming to migration crisis as well here. Europe needs to project that solidarity to the people close to their home, where they are, yeah. spend a lot there. And the money for that should not come necessarily from rising the budget ceilings, but from better application of the subsidiarity yeah. principle. Okay. Mr. Letter. Uh, three idea, th three points. One, the first one is, um, is about unity. I think we have to take lesson from what happened after Brexit. We, I think the way in which the European Union uh, started to discuss about the post-Brexit issue is one good signal because we, uh, we, we are united until now. We are united. And I think uh, under Michel Barnier leadership, we, uh, we showed a great, a great un united approach. I think it was the first time maybe it was not expected because the idea was they will be immediately divided in many different. So is the demonstration that when, you, when we are united, we can deliver, we can uh, take some big advantages. The second point is uh, I think we need to uh, a little bit debrusseliser, if I can uh, use a, a French term. Uh, when I say debrusseliser, I think that is necessary to not to give the people in Europe the idea that we are transforming Europe in a super state, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's wrong to say that Europe is a super state. So uh, the idea that Brussels is a new capital substituting all the capitals is a very bad idea. Right. We have to to work in a more uh, with more subsidiarity, also in terms of sharing the fact that we have 27 capitals. And Tallinn is, is a capital, as Rome is a capital, as Brussels is a capital. The idea that everything is in Brussels gives to the people the idea of a Moloch, uh, of a bureaucratic Moloch, is a very bad message. So right. we have to work on that, we have to apply this new compass. And maybe the third card compass that I think it's necessary to apply uh, it is, is, not, is not easy, but it's not easy also because it's different uh, with the different countries. There are many countries in Europe that it is necessary to apply this the following compass. We have to take decisions and launch policies towards the non-cosmopolitan part of our societies. Because in the last period, and that was the experience, and this is why the rise of populism, we are experiencing a, a phase, a period in which the European Union is perceived as positive uh, by the cosmopolitan part of our society. The other part is thinking that Europe is only for those who uh, uh, love globalization, because it's a tool of globalization. But there's a large part of our societies not speaking three languages, not working in another country, not being cosmopolitan, not wanting to be cosmopolitan because they want to stay in their own village. I, I, I take the experience coming exactly from my, 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 my job at the university in these two years, the Erasmus. The Erasmus is the flag, is the positive flag of Europe, and it is good. But if we say that the only true big, great result of Europe is Erasmus, is a big mistake because right. the Erasmus is, for, as par, is a, for a small part of our societies, for those who, I would say, have the privilege to go to the university. Yeah. 
yeah. that is just a part of our societies. There's a large part of our societies without this privilege. So the idea is maybe to say we, we have to, to create a sort of, uh, I would say, compulsory uh, Erasmus for uh, people of 16. Uh, all the European families having the possibility, not, on, not only those having the possibility to go to, to the university. Right. So this compass, for, for what I think today is crucial to overcome this problem of populism, of uh, non-cosmopolitism, anti-globalization, that is a key problem and we have to avoid this Europe synonym of globalization. Right. For, for many parts of our society, this is a, is a great problem. Well, thanks. You've coined two, two really good, one good word and one good phrase there. The uh, um, de brussellization it's very good. And um, also this idea of the non-cosmopolitan part of society. I think that really, really hit home. Knut, brief word from you. Be very brief. And it might sound a little bit short and a little bit naive, maybe. But what it needs, and this is the duty for the voters mainly, to have convincing personalities. And this is the German experience with Helmut Kohl. You can't imagine how unpopular the euro was in our country. And I know that here many fellow Germans are around. It was maybe 20% support or so. But it was the convincing personality of Helmut Kohl who made the euro reality back home. And the people were trusting the whole European project by transportation through Helmut Kohl. So convincing European personalities, that's a duty for, for, for the voters. And one, just one very brief, I absolutely agree, and they, they fight against a very important um, uh, issue, fight against youth unemployment. That's a typical example. If we say, and if we pretend that the European Union is to fight youth employment, we shouldn't be surprised if things don't go so well they are our unemployed youngsters. Right. Okay, super. Now, I've got a lot of forest of hands has gone up. So, if we have the microphone, first of all, there to the gentleman who I... Beh just behind you, please. Yep. Go ahead. And can you yeah. introduce yourself? Yes, sure. I'm Daniel Brössler. I work for Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you, President, for your uplifting word, uh, words. Uh, being based in Brussels, I'm relieved to hear that uh, Europe is not in crisis. We heard rumors saying otherwise in Brussels lately. <laughs> Uh, and specifically, I'd like to ask you how what you said about communicating about the European Union in your country, in Estonia, how that translates to the European level. Uh, when we see um, a Hungarian prime minister conducting a national consultation, not about Brussels, but, but against Brussels, uh, including outright lies, uh, is it then uh, something that should be left to the European Commission to answer that, or is it the other European leaders um, who should address that, who should, uh, who should give answers as well, who should uh, okay. be involved, and related to that? So I think two, that's already two questions. <laughs> okay, so I'll leave it there. Thank I, you, you very know, much. Just briefly, just briefly uh, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, doubts about uh, state of, uh, state of yeah. uh, the law and rule of law in countries like Hungary and Poland, is that yeah. something that should be left to that the Commission, or is it you for just the other members? That, that's a great I'm question. You've just asked it, so that's very good. There was, now, uh, Georgi Kandalaki here. In the, um, stand up, please, and the microphone will come to you. Yeah, it's behind you. There you are. Thank you, Edward. Uh, I am Georgi Kandalaki. I'm an MP from Georgia, opposition MP. My question is to Mr. Abraham, but perhaps also uh, the President uh, might want to reflect upon it. Mr. Abraham, uh, to what extent does the German political class at this point in time view Russia as a threat to itself? And, uh, and, and whether uh, in Berlin the concept Europe whole, free, and at peace, the concept that is an underlying concept of the European Union, is viewed as fulfilled or unfulfilled until Georgia and Ukraine especially remain outside. And perhaps yeah. that there are still caveats on supplying defensive weapons to these countries is an illustration that still there is no consensus uh, policy-wise on Russia. Thank Thanks, you. Georgi. Well, while um, Knut is digesting how to characterize his country's entire political class, Ian Bond <laughs> had his hand up. <laughs> Ian, stand up so we can see. 
Thank you very much, Edward. I'm Ian Bond from the Centre for European Reform and therefore another representative of the ghastly British. Um, <laughs> I, I guess my question is a little similar to the question from uh, the gentleman from the Süddeutsche Zeitung, which is about European values. Um, you know, they're set out rather beautifully in the Treaty on European Union. And yet, frank frankly, if we look at what is going on in some of the member states, uh, it's pretty clear that, that uh, those values are not being respected. And the EU seems to be powerless to enforce its values. You can't go to the European Court of Justice if you think that Article 2 is being violated. The Commission seems incapable of implementing the rule of law mechanism against countries like Poland and Hungary. So what is the answer? How do you ensure that European values are respected across the whole of the EU? Right. Okay, well, I'll come back to the panel. Um, first of all, there's a specific question um, for President Kariled about how do you communicate the EU um, in Estonia, where even here uh, the tide of Euroscepticism is rising at least uh, uh, a little bit. And then a question for all of the uh, panellists, what do we do about... Um, enforcing EU values in the case of a country like Hungary, which seems to have a different take on them. And then a particular question for um, Knut, which I do at the end, which is, um, does the German political class really see Russia in the same way as I guess everybody in this room does? Uh, President, <laughs> <laughs> uh, President Kailev, you go, you go first. Yeah, indeed, as I said already in communication, you have to be honest and you have to say what Europe can deliver and what member state has to deliver. And, and this was also touched upon by Prime Minister Leta here. Uh, I totally agree that, that we need to pay attention to those who didn't win from the enlargement or from the globalization. They're the same if you look from Estonia's viewpoint. And again, this is not the job of the EU. Redistribution is the job of a member state government and guaranteeing social systems, educational systems for people to manage better in the globalized world is again a member state's responsibility. So it is for the, it is if the member states take the responsibility for the policies they are still responsible for, then it will actually positively reflect back on what we are trying to achieve together in Brussels by applying our five freedoms. Hopefully it's still four. But after the Estonian presidency, I'm quite sure I will be talking about five, the 15th <laughs> digital. About Hungary and Poland, this is a question which comes up quite often, and I thought a lot about it. And I, if I go back in history, and if I think of the uh, developments where the uh, European Union felt that uh, the liberal democratic uh, rule, uh, well, not rules, but values are uh, under threat in Austria, then what did it do? It was the Council of Ministers, it was the European Council which reacted. Meanwhile, European treaties were changed and, and we have Lisbon Treaty now, which uh, with all due respect uh, makes the Commission, uh, well, a uh, gathering of permanent secretaries rather than a kind of a proto-government. And what we see now is when things started to go astray in Hungary, what did the Council of Ministers do? What did the Prime Ministers do? Did they accept responsibility? They didn't. They tried to make commission to solve the issue. Commission had even less tools by that state to do it. It was not possible. And because the action was weak, it was, well, Commission could only kick the can down the road. You now have already two member states who are wavering about, uh, about the democratic liberal values. I believe that the solution is political. And it's the strongest solution is that we come together in the European Council and have an open and honest discussion about rule of law. It's the only way forward. It cannot be delegated to anybody in the, insti uh, in the institutions. It is the political responsibility of leaders of the European Union countries, right. including me, myself, on Russia and on Georgia. Russia is not a threat physically to any NATO member state because NATO's deterrence is, uh, is always adequate because it's developing according to their risk profile surrounding uh, NATO. It apes when there is low risk, it goes up when there is higher risk. And this is how we see it developing also right. nowadays. Therefore, Russia is not a threat. On Georgia, I was very hopeful to hear uh, High Representative uh, Mogherini to say that for her, uniting Europe is still an, still an uh, perspective, still an objective. It would be immoral for us to uh, say the bus door is closed and we are in, you are out. Definitely, we support our Eastern partners, and if, uh, if there is a country which uh, 
lives according to the Euro European values and is compatible to join, I agree, it could at one day definitely join. So the same which applies to Balkans, as said by uh, Federica here a little bit earlier, the same should apply to Georgia, definitely, most definitely. Um, Mr. Lester, as, as a former Prime Minister, do you recognise the President's characterisation of the um, European Council um, pushing um, responsibility to the Commission while not giving it the ability to discharge that responsibility? If I may say, um, I'm today out, so I can be uh, very honest by saying that uh, one of the problems of the European Union is the Council, is the European Council. Because it is too powerful, I think, and because the European Council, not because of the European Council, I think one of the problems was the fact that the Commission gave up, not this one, but the previous one gave up in a, in a moment of big, big crisis, gave up and the European Council took the leadership of the European Union. And I think it's a, it's a problem because the European Council is the only institution in which you don't have European uh, leaders. You have national leaders that are also European leaders. And I think that uh, th there's a problem in the European Council. The problem is the fact that the, the, the 27, they have to consider themselves as a unique body. If not, it, it's, it's a mess. Mm -hmm. uh, in my period, I remember the mess of the 27, no, 28, 29 um, press conferences. I don't yeah. know if it is still like that, but it was, it was a mess. All the press conferences, mm -hmm. national press con conferences. It's, it's necessary to have a, a, a united approach. But the key point, just one word, is about... Uh, uh, about uh, Hungary and Poland, because I, I think it is one of the key points. The, the Visegrad countries are today taking some positions. These positions are different from the rest of the European uh, member states and the member uh, states' approach. We, we were too weak for what I think towards them, and I think we have to be very clear for the future. If not, the only possibility is to work more and more at 19. Mm -hmm. It is clear that the outcome will be to work more and more at 19. When I say 19, I say the Euro area uh, members. And I think, if I'm not wrong, after the German elections, the key point of the Franco-German initiative will be on the Euro, right. on the 19 point. So, I think it is important also for our Polish and Hungarian friends to understand that um, it is not possible to blackmail the others because there is some outcome. And, and the outcome will be uh, a more um, multi-speed Europe with a more strong uh, Europe at 19. That is natural. Politics is like that. That's another really interesting point, the idea of the EU 19 as the kind of functioning motor, both in terms of economic governance, but also in terms of values and so on. Um, Knut, you've had time to reflect. Um, okay, yes, yes. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think, uh, first, uh, oh, first of all, I'm very grateful because this brings me back to solid ground of, of, of my everyday work <laughs> and not uh, on, 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 on the Euro things. Um, I think there is no doubt that Germany is tough on Russia where we have to be tough on Russia. And we have shown that in the last years, I think, uh, undoubtedly. When we talk about Minsk, the whole Minsk process, and especially the question of, of sanctions. So uh, no doubt about our willingness to, to stand up w with all, all partners in, in Europe, but also taking the lead as it was together with France um, in, in the Normandy case. Um, secondly, um, the German politi political class and the attitude towards, towards um, Russia. I know it's, it's on the internet. So uh, it is certainly very different from the majority in this room. 
the German-Russian relations are uh, really different. There is, a, there is a certain number of people in Germany who really believe, and you see them in our new populist movement in this uh, nationalistic uh, party called AFD, um, who really believe, they really believe that it is for Europe's sake if and when Germany and Russia get along well. There's a second group of people who still believe that the instruments of Willy Brandt's and Egon Bahr's detente policy are the right instruments to deal with the current Russian challenge, so, so, so to say. And then there is still um, um, a generation of of, of people who, of course, remember the Second World War and the consequences of the Second World War and tell us, don't mess with Ivan. Don't mess with the Russians. So uh, the, the, the basis in Germany is, is really different. But this is not bringing us to not showing solidarity with Georgia and Ukraine. Of course, it's not the time to go into all details. But let me, Edward, um, mention two wonderful things for which many of you here in, in, this, in this room, and also me, we are, all have been working for, for years and in the end successfully, and that is the visa-free regime yeah, yeah, for yeah. Georgia and Ukraine. I really had my doubts in, 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 the t in time whether we really can make it, given the migration crisis, given the, all the doubts about the future of Europe and so on, but we made it, and we will see the Ukrainians having a biological, whatever that is, a passport, um, traveling, traveling uh, to Europe in June 20th or some, uh, something like that. And, just and this, is a, yeah. this is a wonderful, I think, sign of solidarity, and we will have opportunities enough to discuss the NATO and, and uh, e EU enlargement things uh, later on. But final thing on values, because that yeah. is an important point for us to values, European values. Uh, and a short answer, again, a brief answer. Um, the bilateral efforts would be not effective if we hadn't the European basis. Yeah? That's the reference point we need for bilateral and EU um, uh, activities in, in, in this regard. So no success, in, in, on contrary, it would be a disaster if we would especially us Germans, go around and teach others how to, how to form a constitutional court or so, you know, you know, to tell you how democracy is working oh, from Berlin, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we're going to be, I'm, I'm literally, you're allowed one sentence. Um, first of all, um, Anderson, then behind you, Stefan, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, I mean one uh, sentence. Uh, Anders Ostlund uh, from the Atlantic Council. Nord Stream 2, how does that work in the uh, Russian-German uh, uh, relations? Okay, no this is m monopoly, it is uh, German rents, and it is uh, going against Ukraine. Thank you. Maybe an unfair question, Knut will try and answer it behind you. Just go ahead, can you introduce yourself and say to you? Andreas Umland from the uh, Kiev Institute for Euro-Atlantic Cooperation. Um, there's a link between this sort of optimism, best case scenarios, thinking ahead, for a better future and indeed for a better future of, of the EU. But I think uh, what, uh, and this sort of positive thinking, I'm very much in favor of it. But is there also negative thinking? Is there in the EU, there's certainly negative thinking in, in NATO about mm -hmm. ghastly worst case scenarios, but is there negative thinking about ghastly bad scenarios in the EU as well? I think that was one of the problems with the Crimea crisis that people didn't want to think about it before it because it would have sort of excluded Russia, it would have been sort of uh, such a bad thinking. So and what's, the, 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 what's the, the question? Yeah, is, is, there, is there a planning for worst case scenarios? For instance, the Kerch Strait Bridge is not built, Russia decides it needs a land connection to, uh, from okay. the Donbas to, uh, to Crimea and uh, decides to create a land connection. Okay, you know, that are, you, are you thinking about what to do in that case, or is it just about optimism and looking in a positive future? I think all governments spend a lot of time thinking about bad things. They don't always talk about them. Um, and I, I know, um, if you can say anything on Nord Stream, we'd be very, we'd be very 
interested. It's certainly a huge issue. I know Germany says this is a commercial deal. <laughs> Nobody else thinks it's a commercial deal. Ah. <laughs> Uh, so you have you have you have the speaking points of the government. Of course, uh, this is a co commercial, entrepreneurial endeavor, and we are following the rules. We are following international rules. We are following European rules. If there and if there are any European rules which contradict to this project, we will of course res respect that. But if there aren't, this Nord Stream two pipeline, of course we do see the political impacts, and your question, Anders, is, is of course a proof for, for, for that. But again, the, the, this project is not an indication that there is there out there some German-Russian deep secret understanding and, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, using tricks uh, on other questions. Uh, okay. It's complicated, and it is, it is, as you absolutely know, it is also a question of our internal coalition things. Okay. But it's... it's, it's we'll it's see what happens after um, September. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to finish, I'm going to slightly rephrase your question, Andreas, to, to Kerstin and give her the last word. Because you've raised a really important point. You, do we, we can talk ourselves into a real funk. And there's a real problem, particularly in this part of the world, that people say, we're small, Washington's uncertain, NATO's weak, Russia's huge, and you can talk yourself into a real sense of, 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 of despair. And then there's the other danger of complacency, that you just say, um, the sun will come up, the sun will go down, the sun's shining, mm -hmm. and that also makes the public feel the politicians aren't being honest with them. And perhaps even more than a head of government, um, Kirsty, it's your job as president to try and strike the balance mm -hmm. between giving sober warnings about how dangerous and uncertain the world is, while at the same time making Estonians feel that there are people looking out for them and that you've got, you've got everything under control. How do you do it? Yeah, obviously it's the two sides of everybody's work here daily, on the daily basis. Indeed, the optimism I projected, I also substantiated with the facts about how the European Union has managed. Therefore, I, I believe I'm factual when I'm optimistic. When I'm pessim pessimistic, I'm similarly factual. Of course, we do think, what if, for example, Russia does not disband its, uh, its uh, forces after the Zapad exercise and remains, well, much closer to Belarus than even Belarusians want? Obviously, there is an analysis that this is a risk, because otherwise, why is Belarus suddenly reporting 13,000 people participating in the exercise? This gives them international monitoring levels. Obviously, everybody has these kind of worries, and indeed, we need to honestly talk about what needs to be done to be more prepared. And that is why we are here always adamant that deterrence is not ever done. Mm -hmm. This is something which we sometimes hear. It's done, let's stick to the levels what we have. Deterrence is only functional when it is evolving and developing. Same about the European Union. Yes, there has been the question about what to do with the sanctions if they are not delivering. But sorry, we already applied those sanctions and we applied them because Russia is pushing against our international value-based world order that nobody has the right to decide about others. So now we need to stick to it. Otherwise, we have let another red line to move. We let one to move in Georgia and the avalanche started and it's now stopped in Crimea. We need to be honest about it that we cannot gloss it over. Never ever, even, even if it takes as long as the United Nations mission somewhere in the Middle East. Okay. We just cannot. Super. Well, we've gone slightly over time, um, but we've also set a terrific springboard for the rest of the conference with everything from talking about energy to fake news to the future of the um, European Union and much more besides. So please do two things. First of all, make your way really speedily um, to the buses um, so that we can start the dinner on time. But secondly, join me in thanking our panellists for giving us such a tremendous start to the conference.